maybe put up the uh, first slide. Do we have that under our control? I guess we do. So while you uh, get used to this diagram, let me explain the origins of this, uh, other than both Dave and I in our uh, youth uh, managed to study electrical engineering, and this is the way engineers uh, think about and describe management. Uh, but this didn't, uh, complex diagram didn't uh, spring forth uh, initially from our minds. So just a very brief history. Uh, of course, Dave and I started to work 20 years ago on the problem and uh, formulated the idea of the balanced scorecard, wrote about it in our first book, uh, which was published about 1995-96, uh, based on uh, the empirical evidence of maybe a half dozen companies that Dave primarily had worked with, uh, which included Mobile, a major bank, a major insurance company, a major retailer, and a large construction company. And so from this extensive sample of about six data points, uh, we generalized that this system is good and it must work. Uh, and that was what's in our first book. Uh, by the end of the 1990s, actually, all of those companies continued to survive and do well. Uh, and Dave and I looked at each other and said, hey, you know, this, this thing actually works. Uh, it's delivering results. And we went back to the companies uh, to really understand how they use the balanced scorecard to deliver results and create this breakthrough performance. Uh, that led to our second book called The Strategy-Focused Organization. And in that book, we formulated uh, five principles that we found these half dozen or more companies using to drive breakthrough performance using with the balanced scorecard. Uh, and those five principles, number one was leadership. And this still remains the most important uh, requirement for success uh, is strong leadership. Uh, stage two, we talked about using strategy map and balanced scorecard, translate a strategy uh, into uh, something that's visible, that's easy to describe and communicate, and most importantly, measurable. Uh, so stage two was translate a strategy into strategy map and scorecard. Uh, stage three, we said was alignment. All of these companies were fairly large companies, and they had to align multiple business units and also support units, human resources, IT, finance, primarily. Uh, and that alignment turned out to be extremely important, vertical and horizontal alignment through the organization. Fourth was motivate. Ultimately, people are the ones who execute the strategy. Uh, employees can't execute a strategy that they're not aware of and don't understand. So that turned out to be an extremely important part of all of the successful implementations. And principle five uh, was something about uh, governance or sustain. How do you make strategy a continual process, not a once a year event when the senior executive team goes off to a resort for three or four days uh, and thinks about strategy? Uh, and so that was the principle five, sustain. Now, we realized that even in that second book, uh, while we covered all the five principles, that there was so much knowledge that was being created that we needed to go into more depth in those principles. So that led to soon our third book called Strategy Maps, where we really just focused on principle two, on translate, uh, because we came to realize, uh, and we'll see that throughout the conference, that the development of a strategy map was perhaps an even bigger or at least an equal advance to the balanced scorecard. Uh, and we needed to communicate to people that, that this was not just about measurement, it was really about strategy and linking measurements to strategy, and, and that's what the strategy map did. Uh, and as we were writing that, uh, we realized, God, there's a lot of work going on in alignment, and so that led to our fourth book uh, that came out shortly thereafter called Alignment. And uh, there we covered principle three, organizational alignment, as well as principle four, which was uh, motivation, aligning employees to the strategy. Uh, so that was all going very well, and then we looked around and there was still this fifth principle left out there. Uh, well, what are we going to do about that? And well, I guess we'll have to write a book about this. And sometimes writing the book, we're distilling best practices that we're learning from the organizations, the Hall of Fame that Rob talked about. Uh, but sometimes it forces us to think about, well, what, what is missing there? What do we have to do uh, to really sustain this and make strategy a continual process? And so that got us going on the fifth book. And uh, we were going down the bullet points in principle number five. And I'm not sure, I've been trying to think about where this, some, the early version of this diagram came from. And, and literally, this may have been one of those 
uh, back of a napkin experiences. I actually remember being at one of our Palladium meetings and I was struggling with how do I integrate uh, this other methodology I'm rather fond of, activity-based costing, into this. And I started drawing all these loops. Uh, you know, if we could see where we're making and losing money, then uh, we had the idea of a new strategy. Uh, do more where you make money and less where you lose money. Uh, that's kind of a simple strategy and it actually works. Uh, but then how does that feed back in? And I thought, well, okay, that would be an update the strategy. Uh, if you update the strategy, then you have a new balanced scorecard uh, where you would have some measures. Uh, and then based on that, we'd have to communicate that out. And, and so I started drawing all these loops and diagrams. And, uh, and I think that was the early version. Dave comes in and simplified yeah, right. this. I was going to say, I that. simplified it, and this is what we got. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah you, you, so I guess you'll be happy to know uh, that you're not having to see the original diagram. So and, and it turns out, as we were writing the book, you know, with this diagram and making sense of all the boxes and the loops, we realized, wow, uh, this is not just the fifth principle. Uh, but this is really the steady state. This is the ongoing strategy execution system and something that never existed before. Uh, that we actually have a system, a framework uh, that is sustainable and does deliver on make strategy a continual process, but not by a series of bullet points, which is where we were in uh, our previous writings, but in this integrated uh, system. Uh, and so that's how we got to the HBR article uh, that Rob talked about. Uh, and the book, which came out uh, two years ago. So anyway, that's, that's a brief history of what led up to this. And now we'll give you a quick guided tour through the six stages, Dave. Right. So for the next two days, we're going to uh, take this model, and we're going to drill down in each one of the stages. Uh, we're going to have case studies about how excellent companies have, uh, have used this. We're going to see Hall of Fame organizations uh, that have succeeded. Uh, basically. You know, any management system is going to be some kind of a closed loop. You know, you've got a direction and you've got uh, measures of where you are and then you, you make corrections. Uh, so think, plan, do, check, act. You know, that's the quality cycle. Well, we have six stages in, which incorporate several ideas that are unique in the, in the way that we use them. Uh, beginning with uh, stage number one, develop the strategy. Uh, in the early days, the success of what we did was very much geared around our ability to describe strategy, you know, which to this point in time, you know, was not something that was generally done in organizations. You know, how do I describe my strategy? How do I measure it? And so, uh, so we concentrated on executing strategy, not developing strategy. We basically started at box two. Said, give me your strategy. We will translate it. And we will execute it because. 90% of organizations that have strategies fail to execute them. It's an execution issue, not a, uh, uh, you know, not a strategy issue. But what we found as we built the frameworks for execution, uh, descriptive approaches like strategy maps and balanced scorecards uh, that we introduced in stage number two um, started to give us a better way to develop strategies. And in fact, when we looked at the way most organizations were developing their strategies, they didn't do justice to things like human capital, to innovation, to process. It was all about uh, customers and, uh, and financials, all about lag indicators. So what we do here, and you'll see in more detail as we get into the, the morning, uh, starting in stage number one, we introduce the framework, the vision the, uh, of the organization, the strategic themes become the foundation become the highest level description of strategy. From there, we then begin drilling it down to stage number two. So as, as we can now see that there was confusion, I think, whether the balanced scorecard was a strategy formulation tool and did it compete with many other strategy schools, such as uh, whether it's Michael Porter's or Clay Christensen's or uh, Gary Hamill. Uh, and uh, we, we would answer, as Dave said, it gave you a framework for strategy, uh, but it was not the same as formulating strategy. I mean, two years ago, I was a visiting scholar at INSEAD, and uh, you may know 
that at INSEAD are the founders of what is called the Blue Ocean Strategy, uh, uh, Chan Kim and Renee Mo Bourne. And so I had the opportunity for the first time of meeting Chan Kim. He invited me to lunch, and uh, he was a very warm, open person. And, and I sat down, and he says, oh, Bob, he says, so happy to see you. Balanced Scorecard's so famous. I said, oh, no, Chan, the Blue Ocean's really famous. You sold more books than we did. He says, oh, no, 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 no. Everywhere we go, you know, people talk about Balanced Scorecard all over the world. Uh, so he said, well, how did you do that? And so I was smiling, and I said, well, Chan, you know, actually, you've written about the Blue Ocean strategy. Right? And he says, but really, your ideas are competing in the Red Ocean. Uh, because you're competing with Michael Porter's positioning strategy and Clay Christensen's disruptive uh, model of strategy and the resource-based view of strategy. And there's all these different strategy schools, and you're fighting it out in the Red Ocean. The reason Balanced Scorecard has done so well is Dave and I are in the Blue Ocean. Because <laughs> you're all fighting in stage one for the dominant strategy model, but however you get to a strategy, you have to translate it, describe it, and communicate it, and that's where we are. And there's really no other management tool downstream from strategy formulation other than strategy, using strategy maps and scorecards. So uh, this was the, uh, the fact that that's why you know, we, I think it's been so successful because it has done so well of taking whatever strategy you come up with and, and having a standard template of what the strategy map is uh, and then describe it and measure it uh, and then set targets, and as you'll see, actually do some short-term programs, action programs, the strategic initiatives, which I'll talk about uh, in the last session. Uh, I'm not going to say this morning because we're in Spain, so we don't go to lunch until about 5 p.m., uh, but <laughs> shortly before lunch, <laughs> early this afternoon, uh, we'll talk about the role for uh, strategic initiatives uh, and how that helps to drive the execution of the strategy. So that was stage two. So now, so we now have that description of the strategy, and we now have this next problem, uh, alignment. Dave, and why don't you pick that up? Okay, well, the balanced scorecard has endured the idea is some 20 years since its gestation. Um, one of the reasons, I believe, is because it arrived at the right time in the right place. It arrived, you know, as the, the value model of businesses and organizations shifted from tangible products to intangible knowledge. You know, most companies now compete on knowledge uh, and intangible. And the issue was, how can we manage something that we can't describe intangibles? And, and so what we hypothesized and, and concluded is that when you're dealing with intangibles, the key is alignment. You can take knowledge, for example. If knowledge is relevant to your strategy, it's worth more than knowledge that is not relevant to the strategy. So the key is knowing the strategy and then aligning your organization to that. And basically that is, is uh, adding value through your intangible assets. So alignment is the key. You know, building the strategy, translating it into maps and measures, that gives you the direction. But alignment is how you take it and begin the process of, of converting that direction into action and hence into value. So, uh, you know, if we look at all of the, the different approaches that one could take to uh, uh, strategy and strategy execution, like quality management, Six Sigma, shareholder value, things like that, you won't see alignment in their methodology. Alignment is the heart of our methodology, and so, uh, you know, so it, that it, is emphasized there in our stage number three. So Dave has talked about a little bit about the Deming cycle that's uh, in quality about plan, do, check, act. Uh, I had to admit that I was, must have been the only person in the world who did not understand the difference between do and act. Uh, but finally someone said, well, you don't, it doesn't really mean act. Act and do is really the same. Think about it as plan, do, check, revise. I said, oh, okay, I got that. All right, now that I can understand. Uh, so with that change, uh, what we've described so far in stages one, two, and three is really plan. You know? Plan, develop, and plan the strategy. Stage four is the do. How do we take a long-term strategy and put it into action? How do we align our operations to deliver on the strategy? Because ultimately, strategy has to be implemented, and it gets implemented through 
day-to-day -day work. It's not something you do once a year. It's day-to-day -day work. So how do we, it gets back a little bit to alignment again, is how do we align our day-to-day -day operations and processes to putting us on a trajectory for strategic breakthrough. And so that stage four was really a, more what we were doing in the, in the most recent book is to really think about aligning operations to strategy. And uh, we'll talk about that some tomorrow, but it really is taking your business process improvements and your Six Sigma and your lean management uh, and making sure that that's focused. Because that's the other, two, the other big word. There's alignment and there's focus. Make sure they're focused. A disproportionate amount of energy goes on those processes that are most critical to the strategy. And it's not just processes, and as Dave talked about, the intangible assets. It's about people. How do we make sure we are putting people through training and development programs that is building their capabilities so they get even better and better at those critical processes that are driving the strategy? Uh, and so now we've really gotten focus on our processes. And see, this is what the EFQM and all the other quality models can't give. Those are generic models that apply across the organization. And they diffuse your resources because you're going to be applying that everywhere. And what the strategy map and the scorecard give is the priorities. Which are the most important processes to be truly excellent at? And that's what we've added to that literature, uh, and that's really what happens in stage four. Setting the priorities for people, which are the critical jobs, which are the critical skills that need to go. Uh, 10 or 15 percent of those jobs are going to have the biggest impact on success. It's not 100 percent of your employees or your jobs. And 10 or 15 percent of your processes are going to have the biggest impact on strategy execution. That's what we can identify and execute on and do in stage four. Okay, so we have developed the strategy, we've converted it to maps and measures, we've begun to align the organization, we've pushed it into the operations, you know, now things are happening. And so we begin to close the loop. We monitor what's happening and uh, interpret it and then make adjustments uh, accordingly. Now, one of the important things to always keep in mind here when you, when you look at this is strategy, managing strategy is managing change. Um, is there are some obvious things, you know, when you lay out the products as Juan did in uh, describing uh, the strategy at the bank, you lay out the products, define the customers, those are obvious changes that you're going to make, but there are also behavioral changes. To execute strategy requires people to adopt new cultures. You know, if you're shifting from a product-centric model to a customer-centric model, totally different cultures are required and cultures aren't things that change because you write them on a on a piece of paper so every one of these stages to some extent gives you an opportunity to change the organization but none is greater than stage five when you close the loop think of the power that you have you know every month when you sit down with your management team and you look at the ten most important things to your strategy and you have a red, yellow, green kind of system for, uh, for monitoring it, and things show up red. Now, the CEO sitting in that meeting can say, bad, don't let that happen again or you'll be fired, or he can say, this isn't your problem, this is our problem. This is an early warning system. We're here to work it as a team. Now, those two different approaches, you know, culturally, uh, set the tone for the culture of the organization. You know, are you going to encourage experimentation? Are you going to try to form a team? Or is accountability going to be for the individual? So when we introduce the feedback system here, what we're really doing is we're creating an opportunity and an agenda to discuss change and to help push change into the way that, uh, that executives and managers uh, function in the organization. You know, it's, it's probably the, the best opportunity you have to change culture and to change behavior in organization deals with the way you use stage number five. So stage five is the check, and so actually this is a plan, do, check, revise system for strategy, not for operations, which is what the Deming quality model is. And so we, we're checking, we're monitoring what's happening, uh, where do we need uh, more resources, where might we need less. 
Uh, and now we get to the final stage six, which is revise. And maybe because the fifth principle of our five SFO principles was one we got to last uh, and was the least well developed, uh, as Rob described in his opening remarks, stage six is probably the least developed among any of these six stages. Uh, but it's an extraordinarily important one. Because everything up stages one to five assume we have a good strategy that's worth executing better. How do we know that we, have, we may have a bad strategy? And executing very well with a bad strategy will enable you to fail that much faster. Uh, so it's extremely important at least once a year to sit back and reflect about are we happy with the strategy? Not with how we're executing the strategy, but do we think we have the right strategy? Uh, and maybe we learn internally that as we excel at certain processes and deliver a value proposition for the customers, that's actually not the value proposition they wanted. Uh, General Motors went 30 years thinking that if we could only build cars a little bit better and a little bit cheaper, we will stop uh, you know, this decline in our market share. And they never sat back to think about, actually, we are designing cars that people don't want to buy. They want to buy BMWs, and they want to buy Toyotas, and they want to buy uh, Volvos. Uh, and and the, the, people, the percentage of people who really want to buy Chevrolets is going down. And they just couldn't get out of that mindset that we have great cars, great products. If only we could build them faster, cheaper, uh, that we'll do better. Uh, so stage six is very important to be able to challenge your fundamental assumptions about your strategy to really think about, do we think they're still valid? What have we learned? Some of it we learned from the data. Uh, and this is the opportunity for analytics, a very undeveloped area here. We have software vendors outside that are dying to give you access uh, to lots of data by which you can do uh, statistical modeling to see you know, what can you learn about your customers and about your strategy, which companies are barely exploiting. Uh, but it's also the chance actually to look at risk. And so we'll have a chance to do, some of you went to the workshop yesterday. Uh, you know, we, the strategy was based on one view of the world. You know, how will our strategy do in very different views of the world? And it could either be because what our competitors are doing, that's the role for wargaming, or strange events that happened. Uh, financial meltdown in 2008, uh, a tripling of energy prices a little bit earlier. Uh, volcanic ash shuts down the air system for a week. You know, how will our strategy do in those environments over which we have no control over but yet can have dramatic impact? And so once a year, at least, or maybe quarterly, uh, we should be thinking about uh, how robust our strategy is and whether we might want to modify the strategy. And then based on that, of course, now we have the problem, if we do revise the strategy, how do we put the new strategy in action? Oh, well, we know how to do that. Stage one, you know, develop the strategy, and then stage two, and that's how we go around the loop. And so that's why this is a closed-loop system where each of the stages feed into each other. However, uh, you'll be sorry to learn. Nice We're not done. <laughs> nice and simple. Six stages, logic, um, based on a philosophy. And the philosophy, you know, has to do with uh, leadership driving the process. It has to do with the use of measures to, as a means of interpreting and communication, communicating objectives. It's a philosophy of aligning and focusing the organization. Um, the system allows you to translate that philosophy into action. Now we have an advantage that most don't in the sense that we get to work with many organizations. If you're a single organization, you're working with this model, you get to do it once or twice or maybe in your subsidiaries a few times. Uh, but we get to see it many times. And so one of the, uh, the benefits of that is we're able to see what works and we're able to generalize and communicate that on to others. And so um, these are some of the things we've learned, you know, over 10 years or 10 years plus of working this process are the best practices underneath. So the six boxes obviously are a simplification. You know, just having six boxes or six stages doesn't really help you get there. But uh, as we have synthesized these best practices, we've begun to see how successful organizations use measures to communicate, how successful organizations align their business units to corporate, how they align support units. Uh, we've begun to see how 
linking strategy to operations uh, is done more effectively through the use of process models that were established back in the re-engineering days. Um, so, uh, we've learned that uh, um, strategy reviews are more effective if they're separated from operational reviews. So there's a whole set of learnings there that we have, uh, have developed. And when, when we, uh, we talk over the next two days, we'll be trying to take the discussion down to that level and talk about the objectives, talk about the methodologies and tools that have, uh, have evolved. Methodologies is a key word. You know, it's one thing to say, um, translate the strategy. It's something else to say, here's a strategy map, here's the architecture, here's how we convert it to measures. So it's the methodologies that are important to you and, uh, and are important to us. We try to, in working with successful companies, with our Hall of Fame in particular, we try to look at, introduce methodologies, but also learn from the way in which they're being used and modified so that we can bring them back to you. Now, you'll see that in addition to the six stages here, you know, there's a layer across the bottom. Think of this as infrastructure, because the six stages, you know, describe what it is, what the management process looks like. But the, you know, the entire process is supported by an infrastructure. The infrastructure, as we describe it here, has three pieces to it. One, leadership, okay? Leadership is needed throughout that model to, to make it work. Secondly, technology. You know, the further you get into this model, the more detail it becomes. When you link strategy to operations, you know, now you're dealing potentially with transaction level databases, and technology and analytics become uh, increasingly important. And then thirdly, the uh, organization infrastructure, and specifically the Office of Strategy Management. So, Bob, well, I think actually you covered it, and we, uh, maybe we should uh, open it up for any comments and uh, questions. But just my final remark here is that uh, over this 20 years, uh, beyond having done strategy map a balanced scorecard, what we now see is a body of knowledge for a new management process, which is strategy execution, which did not exist before. Uh, so that's kind of exciting uh, that uh, we actually know how to do what Rob has uh, shown is the number one and the number two priority for senior executive teams. Uh, I would say the only part of this that we can't program is the lower left-hand corner of this, which is the leadership. Uh, I'm hoping that there is a research study at Harvard University, a multidisciplinary study uh, across the sciences, uh, to identify the leadership gene. Uh, so that if uh, you're, somehow your leader uh, doesn't quite get it, or what has to be done uh, in maybe 10 or 20 years, we'll be able to do a genetic transplant to solve that particular part of the problem. But uh, that, in some sense, is the only uncontrollable here, the art here. Uh, but we hope to inspire people who may even not be genetically disposed to be leaders uh, to learn through uh, experience that they actually can become leaders uh, to go on. Gentlemen, before